What's really difficult about talking about this in the context of AI models is that that's not what AI does. It can sort of fool people into thinking it has general intelligence because it has access to so much data. I just, I just don't think that you can say that simply with more compute and with more data that what AI can do will fundamentally change. So how, how do you measure general intelligence? There's a lot of confusion around the meaning of intelligence, mm -hmm. and it's controversial. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why there's so much confusion, is it's, real, it's a very difficult topic to talk about. Um, and especially with the confusion nowadays of everyone talking about AI and AGI, and like, can computers be intelligent in the way that humans are? Yeah, so what's your definition of intelligence? Yeah, so I was doing a lot of research, um, and I think that just one approach in terms of trying to discern what the concept of intelligence is, is just seeing how experts measure it, more specifically through IQ tests. Right, but isn't there like different kinds of intelligence, like creative intelligence or emotional intelligence? Yeah, so that is something that a lot of people think, but specifically when thinking about IQ tests, there is only one kind of intelligence that those tests are trying to measure. Um, so essentially with these tests, there are eight broad categories of trying to measure cognitive ability. And so these categories are verbal comprehension, working memory, perceptual reasoning, processing speed, quantitative reasoning, spatial reasoning, lo logical abstract reasoning, and general knowledge. Oh, so these are the tests that they give to kids at school to figure out who the, who the smart ones are. Yeah, basically. Um, but essentially what they're trying to do with, with measuring the performance across all these eight broad categories is to get at something called the G-factor. And so essentially the G-factor is a... Um, essentially a, a, a recognized correlation that if an individual performs well on one um, category of cognitive ability, they are more likely to perform well on all eight of them. Um, and so this, I think that there are several problems with thinking of the G factor just in terms of its use in conversation when having you know when talking about intelligence mm. and what it means one is that the g factor is essentially just a statistical abstraction of this notice correlation across all eight factors um and because of that there really is no like biological or psychological basis for what the g factor actually consists of and so it's very difficult to, to talk about the g factor because it is pretty a pretty nebulous concept as to what it actually is um, and then there's also essentially a, a, kind of a baked in assumption that we can determine what this g factor is because all eight categories cover all aspects of cognitive ability, but mm. I'm not sure if you can see any gaps in what these eight categories cover. Well, I mean, as far as I can tell, the things I mentioned before, like creativity and, and, and emotional intelligence. Yeah, I mean, the, those are definitely not captured in those kinds of questions. And like, yeah. for example, a test of creativity that Jordan Peterson mentioned in one of his lectures is that he would ask his students, like, can, how many uses of a brick can you come up with in 60 seconds? Of a brick? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you can use it as a doorstop. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, use it as a really tiny table. You can use it as a toenail filer. <laughs> Sure. Um, you can use it as something to put in in your in your turtle um, habitat. <laughs> something that the, the 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 turtle can climb yeah, over. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, I think that that is one example of a, a, a you know a, a pretty effective test of creativity, but. It, it's also not something that is easily fit into a standardized format I mean, because yeah. you know, creativity is kind of almost the antithesis of standardization, right? It's, it's, also, it's, it's very, very hard to completely measure because I guess you could use like, oh, how many ways did you come up with a brick? Right. Oh, it's a toenail fly <laughs> <laughs> filer. Right. But it's like, how do you know if that completely encompasses all of creative intelligence? Yeah. 
Definitely. So, so you can see the issue with creativity. Of course, emotional intelligence is not covered in any of the eight categories I mentioned. Right. Um, but then there's also something that I think is left out, which is general intelligence. And I'm talking about general intelligence in the context of what people mean when they say AGI um, or artificial general intelligence. Because outside of that context, when you say general intelligence, usually you're referring to the G factor. Ah. But when you're talking about that general intelligence in the context, of AI, people are really talking about can this AI learn something in one context and apply it in all others or in other contexts. Um, And I think that this also relates to human cognitive ability in the sense that can you learn something and then create an abstract framework of understanding that allows you to generally apply that knowledge in other situations? Right. Um, a great example of this is just the concept of mental models. You know, uh-huh. Charlie Munger talks about a lot of different mental models for understanding the world, one of which is that the map is not the territory, just the understanding that you have an understanding of the world that isn't the world, right? Right. And that's a mental model that can be generally applied in a lot of different situations, right? But and I think I think AI, like ChatGPT, it can it can sort of fool people into thinking it has general intelligence mm-hmm. because it has access to so much data yeah. of people having general intelligence and applying things in all of those different scenarios, and it has access to the data of things being applied in all of those scenarios, but it's still based on that precedent and it's still abstracting it from those examples, right? Yeah, well, I think that the big thing that's really missing in IQ tests in terms of actually capturing general intelligence in the sense that I'm I'm speaking about is applying general intelligence in uncertain, uncontrolled environments with you know, potentially like an infinite number of variables that you have to contend with. Whereas all the questions in these IQ tests have an objective answer. Yeah. Which means that it's in a perfectly controlled, contained environment, Mm. right? And that's just not what the world looks like, right? Like with emotional (laughs) intelligence. Yeah. Um, Maybe you'll, you can do something or say something, but how do you know if it's the so-called right answer? Maybe yeah. there's something that's so much better in some kind of social environment. Yeah, and uh, like with emotional intelligence as a human, there's like almost infinite degrees of freedom in this, and, and how you actually were to approach a situation with quote-unquote emotional intelligence. Yeah. And the same in pretty much most situations, right? Like the 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 kinds of in the questions that you're that you're answering in these IQ tests are very artificial in the sense that like most questions you face on a day to day on a day to day basis do not have an objective answer and you're working with a very you know uh, you know just a lot of different variables that well one are subject to change in the future uh-huh. two you might not have all the data right maybe you need to go get more data yeah right like also how do you know if that data is accurate Right. And then there's also you're you're taking in that data through your, you know, perceptual framework and and, and, and for understanding the world. Right. And there's just like so many different factors that you have to contend with. And so how do you use general intelligence in those environments and how effective are you at using general intelligence in those environments? How are you supposed to measure that? Right. Yeah. I think that just the broader question of like, can you measure something if it's ambiguous as to what it is that you're measuring, right? And I don't think that that's possible. You cannot measure effectively an ambiguous concept. And as much as one might say, well, the might point to the the statistical significance of the G factor, we don't really know what that G factor really consists of. Um, And I think that, you know, um, accurately defining and precisely defining what it is that you're trying to measure is a necessary but not sufficient condition for actually trying to measure something effectively. So how how do you measure general intelligence? So I think we want to be very clear about the, the definition, and we're talking about general intelligence in the context of the AGI debate. So in that context, general intelligence means to, the ability to generalize learning in one context and apply that in other contexts. Um, so I'm not sure if you have an example to maybe help bring some color into this. Hmm. Okay, well, this is a bit of a silly story, but um, one of these videos from one of my favorite YouTubers, Chris Yu, 
and she was talking about Laundry 101. Um, and laundry is a chore. Usually people don't see it as fun. But that was one of her lessons from that video. Is like, even though it's a chore, you can make things fun. Um, and so we went on vacation, right? And um, at one point, we wanted to go canoeing. Um, and we ended up getting stuck in a storm. And this is not a time when you would think of it being very fun, <laughs> right? Um, you know, the, the, the natural response to this is to be extremely miserable. <laughs> <laughs> but Chris, you helping with just building my idea of, okay, I can make this fun. Mm -hmm. I, I can take this thing that I learned from Chris you and I can apply it here. Um, and so I think we, we started singing, I'm walking on sunshine, <laughs> whoa, the song yeah. while we were trudging through this swamp. Yeah. And it was probably the funnest part of that trip. <laughs> um, so I yeah. don't know, does that's, that really that's apply? That's a great example. I think I can maybe break down a little bit of like what that general intelligence process was because mm -hmm. it wasn't that... Chris, you did a video on, hey, I got stranded in a swamp, and then I decided <laughs> to make it fun by singing a song, right? Yeah. If, if that was a video she made, that would just be taking a precedent and then just applying it in that situation. The parallels right. are obvious, right? Yeah. But in this case, you had to use general intelligence because you were seeing the broader mental model or the principle in what she was saying. Yeah, and not not the specific thing, the, yeah. the bigger thing. Yeah, the a generalized framework for that you could apply in other contexts. And that is an abstraction away from that specific video that you saw. Right. Right. And that's something that, that's the real component of general intelligence that's important. And I think what's really difficult about talking about this in the context of AI models is that that's not what AI does, right? When you have, for example, an LLM, you're just looking at correlations across huge swaths of data, which is right. why, as you mentioned earlier, it can sometimes seem as though they have general uh -huh. intelligence. But that's just because they have access to all of those examples and all of those exactly. direct correlations. Yeah. So it can, it can interpolate and it can extrapolate from that data, um, and it does that very well, but it does not have the ability to create an, an, an abstraction from that data for a generalized framework. Um, it's just like when you, for example, when you teach a child multiplication, you don't feed it every single multiplication problem that's ever been in existence. Mm -hmm. um, you just teach it the principle, you know, of here's how you multiply, and then they can apply that in all other future situations. Right. But that's not the case with AI. Um, the way it learns is because it has, you know, so much data that it can draw upon that it can get to the same place oftentimes, but is not really applying general intelligence. And this is why, you know, you see a lot of people debating this issue. And, and for example, Yuval Noah Harari, um, he wrote the book Sapiens and also the, this, his new book Nexus. He's talking about how AI can generate new ideas. Like this is such a revolutionary technology. <laughs> Brand new ideas. It can have completely new ideas, and that's just simply not the case. Um, and here are some examples of really pure innovation that can only come from humans' ability to use general intelligence as well as creative intelligence. Um, one, one pretty clear example is like the bow and arrow. Right. The only uh, way for that to have not had, you know, general and creative intelligence applied is if there was some, uh, you know, precedent in nature, which I can't think of any. Yeah. Or if somebody accidentally created a bow and arrow. Right. And that seems to that seems to be pretty unlikely. You, you need a small miracle for that yeah. to happen. <laughs> a pretty and like big miracle. any animal for like shooting like a, a little rock thing on a stick mm -hmm. with a it's just like. You don't really see that anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's also something that, you know, you can see with the first human that decided to sing or to dance, right? That's like, there's no <laughs> precedent for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and as well as, you know, the first human who decided to, like, you know, make, do, make a tattoo, right? Like, I don't oh. see any... Precedent. I I actually might have an explanation okay, for how that ahead. could come accidentally... So, you've got a porcupine, right? Okay. Yes. Okay, so the way that tattoos are made is you're pushing mm -hmm. ink into the skin. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, you've got a porcupine with the porcupine quills, right? Right, yes. And then, 
you accidentally pour ink on it, right? right. Uh-huh. And then a human accidentally sits on it. <laughs> and then yeah. you've got a tattoo on, on their, anyway. Uh, <laughs> well, but that seems, I, that seems pretty unlikely. Yeah, not very likely that would happen, but yeah. it's possible. Those are, those are some really good examples of really pure innovation in the sense that, like, this could not, if, if you know, ChatGPT was trained on all the data prior to the invention of the bow and arrow, it would not have been able to come up with the bow and arrow. That's just not how these machine learning models work. Um, and so I think that that is something that's, um, that's very difficult because one, AGI is not defined very well. Like for example, Sam Altman's definition of AGI is that once AI reaches a point where it can do everything that the median human can do. And I think that that's just such a, um, that there's just a lot of moving parts in that definition that make it really difficult for it to actually be practical when we're talking about these things. Because one, as AI improves, what the median human can do will improve. Right. right? <laughs> and also, well, there's a, the median human may not really be exercising general or creative intelligence because for pretty much all of history, that wasn't something that was really needed as much. Right. Yeah. A lot of the, you know, scientific discovery and you know a lot of the inventions did come from that but it wasn't it was a very small subset of the population however those skills general and creative intelligence are now more and more what's in demand but that's that's still something that's shifting right so the median human is not really utilizing general and creative intelligence all that much but increasingly will be right right and will have to be to stay competitive in the job market and it's also like what can ai do but also how it gets there like mm -hmm. maybe um maybe uh an ai can come up with like a, a mozart song but right. it doesn't it, but but the reason why is because it's trained on all this mozart music right yeah. um but then the way that mozart got to it right. was very different than the there way that no ai mozart <laughs> yeah. For mozart. yeah 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 <laughs> and so it was very very different than the way ai got to it yeah and so i think that that is i think that that because there's so many different definitions and oftentimes these definitions are very ambiguous or have certain problems then, okay, well, we don't have a precise definition, so we can't know whether we're at AGR or not. We don't know how to measure it. And also, it's very difficult to measure in, in humans as well because oftentimes the abstraction process that happens has to include some degree of creative intelligence. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's going to be something that's new. It's going to be something that cannot have a standardized framework for measuring uh, and evaluating. And so I think that that's um, something that's very difficult um, because you also see like Elon Musk predicting that, oh, we're going to have AGI, you know, in the next few years and like a decade from now, AI will be smarter than all humans combined. And I think that I think that it's just very difficult to um I just, I just don't think that you can say that simply with more compute and with more data that what AI can do will fundamentally change. Mm. I just don't see how you can get to a place where AI can utilize general intelligence by simply giving it more compute and data. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, perhaps it is possible for some kind of software to have general intelligence or and creative intelligence in the future, but it will have to come from a fundamentally different process than how AI is is currently created. Um, and and so I think that you know maybe that'll happen, but it'll have to have some kind of like breakthrough that we have have not reached yet. Right. Um, that is why we emphasize creative intelligence at Weequal School and Weequal App is because that's what makes humans unique and a complement instead of a substitute to AI.